visiting people and yeah, lots of fun. <laughs> All right, so if you have your Bibles, turn over to Acts chapter 2. We're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. We finished Mark uh, a few weeks back. We did a mini-series on the gifts, the manifestations, and the offices of the Holy Spirit to kind of prepare for this chapter uh, that we're going to be talking about tonight because uh, it is interesting. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read the first 12 verses. That's what we're going to cover with and open tonight, uh, and then we'll get going. So uh, in chapter 2, it begins, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And, as, and at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Uh, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesot uh, Mesotopia, uh, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and the visitors of Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them... T all, or we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. So let's take a minute. We'll pray and get recentered and focus on the scripture tonight. God, I just pray that you would just be with us as we speak through these scriptures that uh, unfortunately man has made a big deal out of. Uh, and they've taken it in different directions, and I believe, God, we've lost focus of why they're actually here. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would just speak to our hearts, reveal to us truths that maybe we don't know yet, or maybe they're truths that we need to be reawa uh, reawakened in our spirit uh, about who you are and why you came and why you sent the Holy Spirit to us, Lord. And we thank you for that, Lord God. We just pray that um, you would just receive our worship as we, um, you know, we come to the Word and we sit at your feet. And I pray, God, that you would train us to be more in your image, Lord. And we just thank you for that. We just ask this in your name. Amen. So, uh, you know, as we're continuing this chapter tonight, this is a, a, a very controversial chapter, and it's one that I want to prepare for and kind of shed some light on. And, you know, as I prayed, I hope that uh, for some of us, it reawakens us, our spirit, and uh, what God has provided for us as we went through that mini-series of the gifts to do what He's asked us to do. So um, put yourself in the disciples' shoes. Now remember, as we finished the book of Mark and we jumped into Acts, um, the, the gospel had just been laid out to them. The, they just saw Jesus, who was uh, crucified publicly, then he rose from the dead, and he's proclaiming to them, look, I went down and I won a victorious battle over death, hell, and the grave. I purchased forgiveness for you. Uh, all this has been done, but there's still one thing I need to do. I need to ascend to the Father so that he might send a comforter to you and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to do and be Jesus' witnesses. Not that we would be witnesses, but that we would be Jesus' witnesses. And that's a, that's a different topic than just going out and sharing your faith. That is being someone who is open to when Jesus says, go or Jesus says do it this way or the Holy Spirit moves upon us we are willing and able to go do that because we know him and we put our full trust in him and so where we're at though with the, the disciples you know this has been 1500 years since the Messiah was starting to be prophesied and you know when they were in Egypt and the Passover was going on this was all things that were leading up to what Jesus was going to do on the cross and that's done and as we begin our verse tonight it says right here in verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost arrived. Now think about that for a second. What is Pentecost? 
Well, that's where we get, you know, the word penti, it just means five. It's where we, you'll see the pentagon and those different things. We'll see those objects and math. Uh, but just penti means five. And so the day of Pentecost is fulfilled in two different ways here in the disciples' eyes. And one of those is just, um, it's, Pentecost was a feast that, it's one of the three main feasts. There's more feasts than just three. But it's three that the Jews would really um, observe and get a lot of attendance because it happened in the summer. So, you know, the other ones happened in the fall and the winter, and it was harder for people to come to Jerusalem. So Pentecost happened in the summer. So uh, it's believed that probably 1.5 or 1.5 million people are actually in Jerusalem when this is going on. This is a huge crowd that's already here celebrating Pentecost. And so if you remember in Mark, Jesus was uh, being portrayed as the lamb, the, the Passover lamb. And so they were celebrating Passover just before his crucifixion. And they were remembering how, G or how God brought them out of Egypt with those miracles. And, you know, he, he overthrew Moses and he delivered them. He parted the Red Sea, all these different things. And, but one of the main miracles that they had to be delivered from was death, the angel of death. And so they said that, you know, if you, if you would observe and go through the Passover meal, you know, kill the lamb, paint the blood over your doorpost. That night, the angel of death would pass over you, but he would not pass over the Egyptians. And so they celebrated that. And in Mark, we learn that Jesus was the final Passover lamb. When he died on the cross, we never have to worry about that again as far as salvation, about the work being complete. That when we die, when this, this mortal tent goes away, we actually get to live with him for eternity. So we don't have to worry about that because he became the final Passover lamb. So there's two ways that this was fulfilled that the Pentecost had arrived. One is Pentecost was 50 days after Passover. So that's where you get Pente 5. You get the, the five 10-day cycles. And so Pente, it's 50 days past that. But now the Pentecost, the, what they have been celebrating for so many years, has actually arrived. They don't, they don't have to wait for it anymore. They don't have to celebrate that it's coming. It has come. The Holy Spirit has come on this day. So for the disciples, they're celebrating, hey, Pentecost is here. Not only is a ceremony here, but what we've been waiting for spiritually to happen. The Passover lamb has been taken care of. Of, and now it's time to celebrate in the fullness of who God is. And part of Pentecost was the celebration was to come in the summer and bring your first fruits and give them toward God. And, and it would be a, that part of that celebration that we, we are giving everything to the temple that is our best that we have to offer and give it to him in sacrifice for the next year. Well, for this, though, think about this. Pentecost, when it fully arrived, this is the first fruits of the church. What we're going to learn about in chapter 2, um, you know, all the souls that are saved, the, the miracles that you see, the signs and the wonders, all these different things. This was the first fruits of the church being born. And so it was, it's, it's a perfect matchup that Pentecost would bring that, that this is the first fruits of the early church. And so as we get going tonight, you know, as I look at this chapter, uh, we're going to see the Holy Spirit poured out. We're going to see the disciples disciples speak in tongues. Um, and I, I just wanted to, I want to acknowledge that those are just, what that means is different tongues. And it, it's given, if when we hear the word tongues, it's always going to be in the context that they were giving praise to God and to His mighty works. They're always pointing to Him. Um, so, but I have to address the kind of the elephant in the room, if you would. Um, you know, people take a, offense to this chapter, which means we have a fence that we have to deal with. And so you have those who will teach that, you know, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the only way that you receive that is if you have the evidence of speaking in tongues. Well, for me, I don't lean that way. Now, I do want to share this. I have the gift of tongues. I pray in tongues. I speak in tongues. And so I don't do that. You, you may not have seen that so far uh, in our ministry. And there's reasons why. I'll teach about that here in just a minute. So when I say that, I don't take that the gifts of tongues lightly. But I'm also not on the other side of the fence where they say, you know, the gifts were done away with. And they'll take 1 Corinthians 13 out of context and they'll say, hey, that's all been fulfilled because we have love now. No, there are specific gifts, and we learned about that in the miniseries, that need to be in operation for the, uh, the edification and the building of the church and for winning souls. And this is one of the things that happened here in Acts chapter 2 was this sign happened when the Holy Spirit came. So um, let's read on here just a little bit again. So in these verses, 
we're going to see a couple different things uh, happening. So let's look at verse 2. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. So think about this. It would not take much to draw a crowd at this time because Jerusalem is packed. Jerusalem is not a huge city. Uh, it's only a couple miles by a couple miles. So you would have people just on top of each other. It'd be like Times Square when the balls dropped and you just, you know, you can't walk. Cars can't go by because there's no room for anybody else. And then all of a sudden they hear this mighty rushing wind. And it's kind of like, uh, from what I understand of the Greek word here, it'd be something like a tornado or a hurricane force wind. They can hear that. And so they are running to the source of where the sound is coming from for them. And they're like, what in the world is going on? We're here celebrating. We've never heard of anything like this. Think about this. They're in the desert. You don't get tornadoes and hurricanes in the desert, do you? You get some windstorms and things. So this, this would be something that would not be typically heard. So again, it wouldn't be hard, but God gets the attention of thousands of people in the middle of Pentecost to come over here and see what's going on. These 120 believers that we read about in chapter 1 who've been waiting since Jesus ascended for this moment. And God gets their attention. He brings it to their attention. He goes on to verse 3 and says, And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. So um, think about this for a second. As they appear, they come around the corner. I don't know. Um, my mind starts putting myself in the context of Scripture. So they're in an upper room. I don't know if it's like right next to a big time square kind of feel where they could just come out of the room or, you know, if some of them went up into the room and saw. But whatever happened when they heard this, they come rushing. They see the disciples. And on top of their heads, they have like this flame that is bouncing back and forth. And as we get into Christmas, you know, a lot of us are going to be around a, a fireplace at some point. This, you know, if we're not even there just because it's cold and freezing the last few weeks. Uh, but I would urge you, next time you're looking at the fire, look at the tips of the flame. Does it not look like a tongue just kind of bouncing back and forth? It's moving at all times. And so this is the imagery that we're seeing here with the disciples. There is something that's... Um, you know, profound to look upon and see. And they're having this experience. And, you know, everybody says, you know, we have to have this, this experience with God in order to move forward. Now, think about, they've already been walking with Jesus for how many years? Three, three and a half years, right? They have seen people raised from the dead. They've seen the blind restored, the sight given back to them. Um, you know, they've seen demons cast out. They've seen all these miraculous things. Did the experiences ever change the disciples? Or are we coming off one of the biggest blunders of the disciples over the last 50 days? Why? Because when the cross happened, when, when the rubber met the road, they turned their backs on Jesus. They forsaked the ministry. They messed up horribly. And despite all of that, despite everything they saw in Jesus' ministry, listening to him teach day in and day out, they messed it up, right? They just, they just came off this huge blunder. So experiences in themselves do not change us. They're good, uh, they're nice to have, they can be an encouragement, but ultimately it does not deal with the heart situation. So it says, when they rolled around, they had these tongues of fire dancing upon them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, and the Spirit gave them utterance. And now in verse 5, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together. They were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. So, you know, as we're in Tacoma, we have a, a really multicultural you know, dynamic here. We have people from all over the world who live here uh, in Seattle as well, but I, I think part of that's just because of our military background too that we have here. Um, so we have lots of different people coming, you know, uh, even in our own church. We have, uh, you know, Korean represented, Chinese representative, uh, you know, Spanish, all these different dialects that are speaking. And it's interesting that what they say here, it says, when these guys rounded the corner, they could hear the disciples, all 120, speaking in their native tongue. Now think about that for a second. When we're learning a second language, uh, or if you're me from back from the Midwest, you're relearning English and how to pronounce some words correctly, uh, you know, it, it can sound broken. It can sound hard. And even though you're starting to learn that language, 
you can actually have difficulty talking back and forth to one another, right? It, it can become choppy, or you might have to alter how you speak so other people can understand. All these different things, but what they're saying here, when they rounded the corner, it was if not only just the dialect that was being spoken, the language itself, it was as if these disciples were speaking in such a way that it took these guys right back to home. That no, It sounds like these guys are from my home town, where I am from. It was more intimate than just my language. I understand them as if I'd known them for many, many years. So that must have been really just something to come around and think about. They're dealing with the marketplace. Uh, as we'll see here in just a minute, there's different languages being spoken. They're, uh, you know, they're buying, they're selling, they're trading, all these different things. So all this week of celebrating Pentecost, it, it must have been, hey, this is, this is different. Wait a minute, I'm hearing all these guys speak in my native tongue, just like if I was home again, uh, and God is just pouring out in this way. And at the sound, it says in verse 7, And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? So again, they recognized that, hey, wait a minute, I know some of these guys. I know them. And yet, even though I know them, I know where they grew up, I know their background, they are still speaking something so miraculous. They know exactly as if they had lived with me for many years. But wait a minute, I know them, They're, they didn't live with me. In verse 8, he goes on to say, And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? And he goes on, and we have 14 different um, you know, nationalities represented here, but this is only a small portion of all those that were at Pentecost. And so, you know, we get a small little glimpse here uh, of all these nationalities. But it says in verse 11, uh, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And so I find this interesting that God would use language in this way. Um, and so, if you remember back in Exodus, when, or, or not, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 11, when the Tower of Babel was going on, and all the nations had come together, they had one unified language, and they built a city, and in the middle of that city, they built a tower, and it says that they became so prideful, they said, we are going to build a tower that will reach into heaven. And that, that's, a, that's a great story of religion right there that, hey, wait a minute, I can make it into heaven on my own. I don't need God. I'm going to build a street that takes me there underneath my own power and own strength. And it says that God looked down upon them in, in Genesis chapter 11 and said, hey, we being the Trinity, we need to do something about this. And so what they did, the Trinity, uh, or God, the Father just said, you know, we're going to go down and we're going to divide them. Because if we don't, Man has become such a powerful force with the way that I have created them. Remember, we are created in the likeness of God. So the, the, the intellect of man, uh, the ingenuity of man, at that point, under a unified language, unfortunately, all their focus was on selfishness and getting away from God and going around God, that as a unified front, he said, if we don't put a stop to this, there's nothing that man can't do. And what he meant by that is there's nothing that man can't do to skirt me. And so I've got to put a stop to this. I've got to divide them. And so when he came down, he divided them into different languages. He gave, he gave them all different languages. And think about that for a second. If you're, if you're working on a structure and you're like, hey, um, I need this brick. Can you give this to me? And you're like, okay, yeah, here's the brick. And, you know, I need a 16-penny nail or whatever it is. Or I need this steel beam. And they're, they're just passing back and forth and they're working on it. And one moment and the next moment, you know, they're starting to say in, you know, in Chinese they're speaking or, you know, the language which we know today or in Japanese or Korean or German or Russian, uh, they start just speaking back and forth. How, how bewildering that must have been at that point. It just separated them because at one point they were unified on one language, but now they're not. And so here, to reestablish the church, to reestablish what Jesus said, look, I am the only way, the truth, and the life. He brings language back in. And so we'll see out throughout the whole book of, or the whole chapter, there's two different types of languages that we're going to look at here. And so two of them, when it says tongues and languages, it's the Greek words that are talking about um, dialect is one, 
and the other one is glossary. So that's where we get those words. And so when you think about this, uh, one is talking about glossary, where we get the definitions of words, and one is dialect of how we articulate, and they go back and forth. They're interchangeable between tongues and languages, and it keeps going back and forth that way. And so the importance to understand of what this is actually doing is um, God is giving through the Holy Spirit the definitions and the language to actually speak here. Um, and so when we look at this, um, so the two Greek words, uh, glossia and dialectus, uh, is what I was talking about. I want to point this out there. They are the same and they share this to keep, I share this to keep this event simple and not to read more into it or less into it uh, of what's happening. So each of us in his own native language. Um, so often, you know, when we're learning that language, that's the barrier. And so, you know, even in the, the type of communication I've had with certain individuals this week, um, communication has been an issue. Even just speaking English has been difficult. Wait a minute, I, I hear you saying this, and you have to come back and say, no, that's actually not what I meant. Let me try it again. And, and, you know, it can be difficult to have that relationship. So what's different? There's two different things about this language uh, that they're speaking here. And one of them is, you know, um, I was hearing a, a good teaching this week on angels. Um, and I don't want to get off the topic, but I think it's a good illustration of what we're talking about here. And so, do you remember in Isaiah, there's the cherubims, and it says, you know, when they were in the presence of God, they had to cover their feet and they had to cover their eyes. And so, we know that angels, though, they don't have physical eyes like we do. So when we look at an event like this, we see it in you know, our normal physical dimension. We, we see it in a, such a way uh, that we understand it and we can look upon it. And, w- and with all of our intelligence, all of our understanding, we see it only in the way that our physical eyes and ears will let us hear. But the angels don't see things like that that way. Um, when you think of an angel serving the Lord in the temple like the cherubims, And he says, you know, he had to cover his eyes. It wasn't because his physical eyes could not handle the glory of God. So when angels are looking, it's much like God. It's, it's, an, it's rather, um, to translate that, it would be more of an understanding. So the way that the angel looked upon God and understood him, when God revealed himself and his glory and his majesty, and he, he presented all himself in the temple, the angel could not even look upon him. It was too much. It, it blew all the senses, all the, the knowledge and the understanding the angel had. It was too much for him to comprehend. And so when we think of events like this with the Holy Spirit coming on the scene and, you know, this is marvelous. He, you know, he, he's touching all of our senses. We're seeing things. We're hearing things. Um, our understanding is being uh, there as well. So it, it's becoming overwhelming. And it just says these guys were just, when they looked upon it, they were just confused and perplexed. And so when you're thinking about tongues, um, it says, you know, those two things go back and forth between dialect and the understanding. And so when you think about this, God is unifying the heart of the disciples. This is more than just articulating words. Um, It says when they were there, they were what? In one mind, in one accord. You know, sin can do that too. It can bring, like just like we saw in the Tower of Babel, it can unite people for the wrong purpose. But when Christians come alongside of each other and it's a Christ-centered, we talked about this as we worship, our center focus of worship is the cross. That is it. Without that, we have nothing else. Without that, we can't get to God. Without what Jesus did on the cross, we can't do anything. We can't do anything on our own. And so, um, to point that out, what I mean by that is in Exodus, when Moses gave the law the first time, 3,000 men died. Think about that. The law killed them. The law exposed everything, every flaw, everything about them. And next week when we get into this, when God comes on the scene with the Holy Spirit uh, and He gives us the gift of this, the Holy Spirit empowerment, when that act of grace is given, when that act of empowerment was given, instead of lives being taken because of sin and because of our weakness and because of our failures, and remember, the, the 120, the, these guys were scattered just weeks before. They were failures in the faith in that sense. But on this day, 
when the gospel goes out in power, talking about the mighty things of God, that's what the tongues are saying. On this day, that message is so unified, that message is so powerful, that 3,000 men will come to know Him, will come to the cross and accept Him. Um, that's a huge difference in the two things. So you have the law that was given. The law was given to expose us and to kill the flesh. And that's what it did. That's why people had such a hard time dealing with it. Uh, they made addendums as the, the Jewish traditions to try to get around it. But that's what it was for. It was a tutor to expose us that we are in need of a Savior. And then when the Savior did come, then that was the fulfillment of Pentecost. He's here now. And think about this. You know, we'll read this next week, but if you read Peter's entire message and you read it as if you were announcing it from behind a podium, it would probably take you about three, three and a half minutes to preach this. Not much. And out of a three to three and a half minute message, 3,000 people are saved. What's the difference? What's the difference between that and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis witnessing? Witnessing is good. Witnessing is a practice. Paul tells us you need to do the work of the evangelist. You need to keep doing what you're called to do. But there are moments that God arrives on the scene in everybody's life where there will be times where it could be just one person that is impossible to save in our eyes. You know, like we talked about what we work with during the, the week with people who are addicted or have been abused or have been hurt uh, or they have so much going on that it seems impossible to reach them. That's when the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when the feeling of the Spirit comes up and He rises up inside of us and He gives us the words to say in such a way that it's powerful and it breaks through the chains that hell has bound them with, that sin has bound them with, that the hurt has bound them with. And so that's the difference between what happened with Peter when he's saying, you know, hey, God, I'm not going to let you go to the cross. I'm not going to let you do this. I'll, I'll go with you. I'll do all these things. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Because the focus was on Peter. And now when Peter talks in the next little bit, the focus is going to be on God. So when you look at the tongues, um, it talks about this. It says the tongues uh, in verse 11 that they were hearing, they were proclaiming the mighty works of God. And so, you know, there are tongues. They're still, they're, they're still in uh, action today. They still get used. Paul gives us a little bit of illustration with this uh, in 1 Corinthians 14. Let me read for a minute here. It says, There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if you do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves... Since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, that's a good thing. It's good to, to be excited about God moving. Strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he might interpret, or that he may be interpreted. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or most three, and in each turn, and let, them, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. That's really important. What's tongue's focus? It's between the person and God. And he goes on to say, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For, you, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consultation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now this is a phenomenon that's going on here in Acts chapter 2 that we don't see very very much in Scripture. But the Holy Spirit actually becomes 
the interpreter. What he's given was a message for each and every person to hear. And so, you know, you will hear individuals will be preaching uh, or they could be just talking and then just speak in tongues randomly. That's not the way it's given. Pre speaking in tongues is not a preaching or uh, a testimony to someone because Paul's very clear. It's going to confuse them. It's not for any purpose. Um, so the tongues, what he's talking about here, is he's, he's reminding us, and it's coming right along with chapter 2 here, when they heard it, when the Holy Spirit translated it into languages that they could understand, every person could understand his native tongue, what were they hearing? The mighty works of God. So when you hear, you know, in a church service or a prayer meeting, um, it, it can be, you know, you can see tongues interpretation. I always hear, how do you know that was the correct interpretation? Well, the first and foremost thing that you will look at, did the tongue and interpretation point only to God or did it point to man and what he can do or to build man up? That's not what it was given for. It was to proclaim the mighty works of God, to sing hymns and praises, and to proclaim who He is. And so when we think about that, that's what that is for. Uh, and it's, it's, an, it's an essential tool in a Christian's tool belt. So to say it's gone or passed away, that's not the right answer either. But as we'll see, there were different manifestations of the Spirit so, uh, that happened on the day of Pentecost. You'll see tongues and interpretation to begin with, and then what Peter's going to do is turn around and prophesy. So you'll see both of these things happen in the way that Paul is talking about. It's good to have tongues if there's interpretation that happened. Then God is he's, he's doing multiple things in Acts chapter 2 to show this is the birth of the church. This is me doing this. This has nothing to do with these guys that I picked to do this. This is all about me. And so that's why the tongues are proclaiming this is the mighty work of God. This is what he has called us to do. And not only did he call us to do it, but he's going to give us the power to do it. He goes on to say here, uh, in verse 12, it says, All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. So you're going to have two responses, uh, probably actually three. So you're going to have those who are experienced with uh, you know, the Lord, and they're going to say, Hey, that, that whatever God did at that moment didn't surprise me. You know, I've seen Him do many, many different things. I've seen Him move in people's lives. Uh, and I'm not talking about, you know... Um, you know, the outlandish portions where, you know, you're rolling on the floor and those crazy things. Um, what, what were the disciples doing when this happened? Just like we were. We were sitting. They weren't working anything up. They weren't trying to do anything. The Holy Spirit came upon them while their heart and their mind was simply focused on Him. So you will have individuals who have had experiences with the Lord and you're like, that was God. That didn't surprise me. That Praise the Lord for what happened. But then you'll have those who will have two different responses. It says, you know, some of them questioned. And it's okay to question. Uh, it's okay to say, hey, what was that? I've never experienced that. Or, uh, you know, I've never seen that happen. Or, you know, why in the world did you come to a street corner, you know, at 11 o'clock at night uh, to tell me that Jesus loves me? It could be something as simple as that. And they just don't understand it. It's okay to question. Those are the ones who are looking, hey, what is this? What does this mean? And there's your end. But then you also have those who will mock. And that's where we get hit, you know, in our Americanized culture today. You know, when we're, when we're not Christians, what do we do? We proclaim our lifestyle. This is what I did last night. This is where I went last night. This is what I enjoyed doing last night. Or for sports fans, you know, this is, this is my team. This is what we do. Uh, you know, they're great. We, we herald them and we, we, we just tell everyone about it. Or for parents, you know, hey, this is our kids. They're wonderful. They're straight-A students. Or, you know, they're good at this. Or, you know, this is my wife. Or this is my relationship. Or this is the car I purchased. We have no problem being bold like that, right? We have no problem pro uh, proclaiming that but what happens is as soon as we become Christians and we get the gift of the greatest news on earth that hey wait a minute every person was in need of Jesus everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory there's no one that is above another we are all in need of being at the foot of the cross and growing at his grace we have that message and what happens I start to whisper about it yeah I'm a Christian glad you asked me because I was afraid to tell you why is that? Because it boils down to, just like Peter, 
If you remember, he was in the courtyard when Jesus was being accused and, uh, by the Sanhedrin. And what happened? A little young girl in her teens and an elderly woman came to him and accused him of being a Christian. And what did he do? He denied him. So what happened from a person who will deny Jesus to a teenage girl and an elderly woman and run away and curse at them for it to now a man who's coming out of a room after waiting on the Lord, after being filled with the Spirit in such a way that he's going to stand before thousands Think about this and proclaim this is what we all have been waiting for. That happened because the Holy Spirit came upon him. That happened because it's not about Peter. It's not about me. It's not about you. And I think it's what we get to, well, what are they going to think about me? Because they know my past. They know who I am. Or, you know, I don't have the perfect words to say. That's getting into tradition and to religion and man-made works. And it's losing trust in what God has called us to do. Did he say, go make disciples unless you can't articulate it well? Go make disciples unless you're too busy at work. Go make disciples unless you don't have a really good testimony. Did he say anything? Did he give us a clause or a way out of that? No, he said to go proclaim the gospel, make disciples, baptizing them, go to all the nations and do this under the pretense that this day Pentecost has already arrived. And that's good news for you and I today. 2,000 years later, the tools and the ability to win souls do not rely upon you and I. Our strength will never do it. All God is asking of these 120 that were up in the upper room praying is, I need you to be open and not be afraid of me moving. But when I do, allow me to move so that I can reach those that are impossible to reach. So they're the, the mockers that are there. So, you know, I could have went into a lot of Greek definitions. I could have went into a lot of different things. But I just simply... Where we get away from this is, you know, man says, hey, we need to do it a certain way. You know, there's four times where the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes upon people in the book of Acts. The first one is here. And yes, yeah, speaking of tongues is part of that. And so there's a second one when Peter goes to Cornelius' house, the Gentiles, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And he says uh, to all the Jews, hey, we can't tell the Gentiles they can't be saved because the Holy Spirit came upon them the exact same way He did for us. And then He found, again, another group of Jews uh, with Paul. And He lays hands on them. And they were, just, they were just disciples of John the Baptist. They didn't know, but they were still Jewish. They needed to understand uh, a certain aspect of the gospel. So when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. The third time, now think about who Luke is. He's a physician. He's a documenter. Uh, if you read Luke and Acts, he does not leave things out. He puts them in there because he was hired and, and given the task to do so. And so when Luke is on the site of the fourth one, they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but there's no tongues revealed in that scripture. Now, what was the difference? What were the Jews needing to overcome? The gifts are given to edify, to build the church, and part of that is maturing out of our sin and out of who we were and to be more like Christ. So if you're Jewish and you've been told the last 1,500 years, you are it, you're the nation, you are the chosen one of God, but then the Holy Spirit comes. And what happens? The gospel goes out in every single language known. It's not just for you guys. It's for everyone. And the Gentiles received it the exact same way. I want to remind you, this isn't just for you. It's for everyone. Anyone who would call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a huge message. And, you know, he separated mankind when they were unified in sin, but the church, he gets to bring them back. And the language, that spiritual thing, you know, that spiritual language is to proclaim these mighty works of God. And if there's interpretation with it, that's going to uplift others. They're going to hear like, oh, I, I, I know what's going on. I heard it. I heard it proclaimed. But it's always going to point toward God. And all these other, all these other ways that you hear men teaching this, you know, um, 
you got to do it a certain way or you got to you know proclaim it a certain way whatever it might be that's man's interpretation of how man needs to do things we cannot put God in a box if we start doing that we, we not that we can limit God but in our minds we limit him and we say God you can only move this direction and he's such a gentleman he won't overstep you but if you're in one mind one accord that God we're here to watch you fulfill the promise when you told Peter, hey, on this faith that God gave you to proclaim that I'm the Messiah, I'm going to build my church, I'm going to do it. When we have that, we can put that trust in Him. That's what they're proclaiming, that we can do this. So how do we just apply this, these first, you know, simple 12 verses in our lives? Um, you know, I was thinking about this. It says, uh, my notes here would be, we need to create an atmosphere of anticipation and waiting upon the Lord. We need to Say, look, God, we don't want to do anything in our own power, our own strength. And we need to create the atmosphere that when he does move, we go without a shadow of a doubt. You know, when we went to the Hilltop Kids to minister to them, and we went to pick up trash in, you know, uh, the gang territory, all these different things. When we went to the missions to serve, all these different things. You know, those weren't just saying, I want to go out and serve. That was the Holy Spirit saying, it's time. It's time to go out and minister to those that you're, you know, might be intimidating to be around. Uh, we need to open and not be afraid of God dynamically moving in our lives. You know, that, and I, I have to overcome this. You know, there's times that God tells me to go do something, and I wrestle with it. And unfortunately, not every time I do submit. But then I hear about it, I'm like, why didn't I go? Why didn't I pick up the phone? Why didn't I do what he was calling me to do? That person needed me to be there. And those are growing pains that I have to go through as I mature. Um, and again, don't put God in a box with tradition or just say God only moves in this way. We, can't, we have to get away from that. And then when God moves, we are, uh, when we are working under the power of his might and not our own. So think about that mighty rushing wind that came in. That's very symbolic of the church going out. It, wind, it, Jesus describes it as... You know, you don't know where it's coming from, you don't know the source, and you don't know where it's going, but you see the effects of it. And that's the church. A lot of times, you know, it stays really silent, and all of a sudden God moves again. You see the fire and the flame of a burning Christian being motivated to move. And that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does, is it's, it provides in such a way a Christian who's not complacent, who's not happy with sitting in the seat, who's not happy with just, you know, I'm just going to do this. Their desire, their passion, and I believe that's why the picture of the fire is there. That burning passion, you know, it talks about our burning passions for sin. Well, we need one for God. We need a burning passion for Him. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, it creates that burning passion to where we have to be living our life for Him. That's the difference. That's what happened with Peter. Wait a minute, this isn't about my reputation anymore as a disciple. This isn't about what I can do for Jesus this is about what Jesus did for me. And I want to proclaim that. And I want to watch Him do it in someone else's life. And it's not about my power, my might, but it's about His. Alright, let's pray and we'll end another song of worship. God, we just thank You tonight for Your Word. We thank You for... This has been an interesting two weeks. I've left my notes and just talked through Scripture. Um, so God, I don't know why...